Eternal Health, episode number eight. You're listening to the Eternal Health Podcast, where we discuss God's great design for your life in body, mind, and spirit. Your host is Laura Rimmer, who's a plant-based nutritionist, author, speaker, and health coach. Looking for yoga tips or the latest protein shake recommendations? Sorry, you're in the wrong place. If you're ready for no-nonsense, multi-layered health expertise, drawing on evidence-based nutrition and biblical principles, welcome to Eternal Health. For show notes and to download your free 5-Minute Optimum Health Scorecard, please visit laurarimmer.com. Enjoy the show. Hi there, it's Laura and welcome back to Eternal Health. I've had a very busy week actually, really busy week, really exciting week. On Monday we had a celebration of the Reformation, the 500th year of the Reformation in our church and we had a special theology study all about Martin Luther with, we had some beer, some German beer, German sausages, I didn't have the sausages because I'm vegan um, and I'd eaten already but um, yeah it was a really great session, really encouraging and yeah nice to get together with my church family and then on Tuesday As a church, we went bowling and had beer and bowling, so another bit of beer, which is unlike me actually to to drink. Not that I had much, I had like one pint um, over the two days, but it was, yeah, really nice, so great start to the week. And then I've just finished the week, so um, I spoke at a vegan event yesterday locally, which was really good, and met up with lots of other vegans and people interested in in veganism and, and diet and health and things met a really interesting lady who went into a lot of detail about fermentation yesterday so I might do an episode something that I've been interested in for a a while actually so I might do an episode on fermentation and fermented foods and their benefits over coming weeks and months but anyway getting back to today so what we're talking about today in episode eight here is about cow's milk and how it's ruining our health and how we've been brainwashed by the dairy industry. Now that might sound like a strong title and obviously I'm going to go and proceed to explain what I'm talking about but um, yeah it's strong isn't it how milk is ruining our health well I believe that it is and there's a lot of evidence to to back that up. So that's going to be the topic of today's show and a bit of background on why I'm doing this topic well so I since I've been vegan over the past almost seven years I haven't drank any dairy milk and I've got to say I feel much much better for it my skin is better than it used to be even as a vegetarian my skin has got and following an alkaline diet you know for many years before that going that extra mile and giving up dairy is has been great for my health so my skin is better I have less period pains than I used to in terms of my endurance and athletic performance and stuff so I did my ultra marathon as a vegan and pretty much injury free and felt really great on it my recovery is great had great um, energy and things so yeah I can certainly attest for the benefits of giving up dairy milk And the reason why this topic is interesting and important for for us today is because more people than ever really have milk intolerances and also associated diseases which are related to hormones and obviously there's a lot of hormones in milk and I will talk about that later in the podcast but there's a lot of hormone related diseases such as breast cancer you know it's a huge um, a huge problem in our society And so we really need to look at the possible link between dairy milk and things like breast cancer. And also because the game has changed in terms of farming and things, we're not operating really as food and farming anymore. It's more of a factory line. And that has implications not only on the welfare of animals, but also on our health and, you know, how the milk is produced and what's actually going into that milk. So we'll talk about all that kind of stuff. And also, quite simply, the rise of veganism. There's more people really than ever going vegan now. And supermarkets and stores and restaurants and things are having to step up to the plate on that and provide 
dairy milk alternatives which which you can find in abundance now and again I'll be talking about dairy milk alternatives later in the show so let's get into it I'm going to be talking about four main points in this episode on dairy milk so number one is the fact that the game has changed in milk production number two we're going to look at the propaganda of the dairy industry Number three, we're going to look at diseases linked with dairy milk and evidence to back that up. And then the fourth point is we're going to look at milk alternatives. Are they any good? How can we use them? Which ones are best? Where can we buy them? All that kind of stuff. Okay, now I'm going to start with the subject, which is probably the most difficult for me to talk on because as a Christian and a vegan, I have both of those things to hold up and weigh up at the same time when talking on the subject of the fact that the farming industry game, if you like, has changed and it's the the issue of commoditization of animals and factory farming and it boils down to the cruelty of animals. So I want to first off say that as a Christian, there's a lot of theology in the Bible about about animals and their ultimate destination. And I firmly believe, looking at what the Bible says, that animals will be redeemed in the new creation. So any animal that dies will be with Jesus, will go immediately to the presence of Jesus. And when Jesus returns and we're, we enter the new creation, then animals will be fully redeemed. So I'm not ultimately worried about their destination. I know that all animals, um, there is something in Genesis to say that if an animal kills someone, then that's a different story. But for the most part, animals will be redeemed. But also, we are told to be good stewards of the animals and the planet. And it's very hard to see a lot of evidence of that in this day and age. Yes, we can all look out. So in England, where I am, you can look out in a field and see cows grazing and think, that's fine. The dairy industry, the dairy farms are are, are fine. You know, those cows are milked in a nice way and we've got nothing to worry about. However, that's not often, more often than not, that's not the case and you don't see all that goes on in dairy farms. So this isn't an animal rights activism podcast. This isn't, um, I'm not going to go on a rant or anything like that about animal cruelty, but let's just look at the facts and relate them to, you know, yeah, to, to health, number one. And my aim with this was just to relate it to health, but I found in the research of this podcast and I've looked at this stuff before, but revisiting it for this podcast, my conscience really is, you know, it's pulling on my heartstrings because the main reason for me going vegan six, almost seven years ago was I sat down and watched some animal cruelty videos. I watched some farming videos and after, you know, floods of tears, I decided there and then to give up meat and dairy I'd already given up meat but dairy because in many ways the dairy industry is more cruel than the meat industry so watching I watched a couple of videos in the preparation for this this podcast and again it just brought me to tears because it's it's really bad what the cows go through and I'm not here to condemn you if you drink milk if you eat meat currently that's not the idea of this but just to be thinking about what goes on just to have your eyes open to the reality of things and in a purely selfish way just look at the effects that the cruelty of animals and the commoditization of animals has on the health of that milk so let's look at that so i've just got a um, i want to just quote this from the guardian newspaper it came out in uh, march 2017 let's start with the uk dairy industry and i'm not going to spend a long time on this i'm just going to give an overview i will leave in the show notes a link to a video from peter the people for the ethical treatment of animals and it's one of their less hardcore videos it's just a minute or so with a famous actress giving a little overview of the dairy industry so it's not full of blood and guts it's not too bad to stomach at all so I will leave that in the show notes and the show notes for this episode are laurarimmer.com forward slash eh008 so let's just look at what the guardian has to say about the UK dairy industry 
the dairy industry amounts to systematic cruelty. In reality, the daily practices of most dairy farms are more distressing than those of meat production. A mother cow only produces milk when she gets pregnant. So starting from the age of 15 months, she will usually be artificially inseminated. Farmers mechanically draw semen from a bull and then force the female cow into a narrow trap known as a cattle crush, where they will brutally impregnate her. When she gives birth, her calf will typically be removed within 36 hours so the farmer can steal and sell you the milk that is meant for her baby. Wildlife experts say that the strong bond between cow and calf is formed quickly after birth. Following that callous separation, the mother will bellow and scream for days, wondering where her baby is. The answer depends on the gender of the calf. If male, he will probably either be shot and tossed into a bin or sold to be raised for veal, which delays his death by just a matter of months. But if the calf is female, she will usually be prepared for her own entry into dairy production, where she will face the same cycle of hell that her mother is trapped in, forced impregnation, the theft of her baby and a return to the cattle crush two or three months later. For at least six months of the year, she will often be confined inside dark sheds, but a growing number of dairy farms in Britain use a zero grazing system in which cows spend their entire lives indoors in increasingly intensive structures. So that's the state of the UK dairy industry and I'm quoting from the Guardian which is a mainstream newspaper so just to say that I'm not just drawing my evidence from there. If you look at Dr. Neil Bernard's book, for example, The Cheese Trap, he talks about this. Um, I've seen it with my own eyes. I've been to dairy farms not too far from where I live and seen cattle living in slovenly, disgusting um, housing indoors, not out grazing, with huge, oversized udders and really quite ill. A new study from the Environment Agency shows us that the UK now has almost 800 US star mega factory farms operating. And this represents a 26% rise in intensive factory farming in six years, a shift that has been transforming the British countryside. So what do these conditions mean for the animals? Well, it means that typically in factory farms, animals are raised and kept in CAFOs, which are concentrated animal feeding operations. So this is a very confined, intensive setting. So we've all seen, you know, cows and pigs in little, tiny little pens in long, long rows. And that has implications on the health of that animal, on the health of that cow. And what happens is, and I've, again, I've seen this firsthand, cows will get things like mastitis. So their udders will be so swollen and infected that they get mastitis. Mastitis is a painful mammary infection in cows and it means that E. coli can be present in the milk. Now, here's the thing, right? Now, this might put you off your milk if you are a milk drinker at the moment. Somatic cell count, which is pus from that mastitis in the mammary glands, is an indicator of the health or disease of a cow and the level of infection. And cows with a somatic cell count of 300,000 per milliliter and higher are classed as infected. You might be surprised to learn and possibly repulsed to learn that a somatic cell count of 750,000 milliliters is allowed in your drinking milk per milliliter. And that is 750 million pus cells per liter of milk. And the average somatic cell count in US milk per spoonful is 1.12 million. Yuck. And because of this high incidence of mastitis and other infections that the cows get from living in such confined quarters, then they're routinely given in the US antibiotics to try and quell chronic infection. And they're also injected with recumbent bovine growth hormone. So this is, just to be clear, this is in the US. This is not allowed currently in Europe and Canada. It's been banned. But recumbent bovine growth hormone, RBGH, is a genetically engineered hormone that was approved for the US in 1993 by the FDA, Food and Drug Administration. And this growth hormone was devised by Monsanto, the company that routinely creates um, genetically modified soybeans. And it has the purpose of growing a cow very rapidly in order to produce 15 to 20% more milk. Now, 
proponents of this growth hormone say that there's absolutely no danger to humans at all, but evidence would show different. It would show that pumping cows full of these growth hormones has a really negative effect on our human hormones and is linked to diseases. So these are just a few of the things that we need to consider when thinking about drinking dairy milk because really farming techniques have changed so rapidly in the last 50 years that we really need to think about this and be strategic when when making our food choices. And people really are waking up to this reality. It's no longer the campaign of idealistic vegans to be concerned with the welfare of the animals. It is a mainstream concern for all of us, not only for the welfare of the animals, but for our own health. And just to end this section, I'll finish with a quote from the Guardian article that I mentioned earlier. Dairy is proving to be a vulnerable spot for the entire slaughter racket. The industry is starting to panic. David Dobbin, chairman of Dairy UK, fears a demographic time bomb as young people increasingly shun milk. Only 10 years ago, there were about 21,000 dairy farms in England, Scotland and Wales. Industry analysts believe there will be fewer than 5,000 left by 2026. I want to move on now to the next section on the propaganda of the dairy industry. And I'm going to keep this quite short and simple. And you can look into this a bit more if you want to. But I'm just going to give you a a few quotes from some sources and organisations that really know about this stuff and has made it their life mission to find out about this. Bruce Friedrich, who's director of vegan campaigns at PETA, says that the dairy industry has a powerful hold on the nutrition industry in this country, the US. It pays huge numbers of dietitians, doctors and researchers to push dairy, spending more than $300 million annually, just at the national level, to retain a market for its products. The dairy industry has infiltrated schools, bought off sports stars, celebrities and politicians, pushing all the while an agenda based on profit rather than public health. So $300 million spent annually on this lobbying and propaganda and buying off different people strategically to promote dairy. It's it's crazy. And the other quote is from Dr. T. Colin Campbell, who is the world's leading epidemiological researcher in the field of diet and health. He's author of The China Study, the largest human study done on nutrition to date. And he says this, The dairy folks ever since the 1920s have been enormously successful in cultivating an environment within virtually all segments of our society, from research and education to public relations and politics, to have us believe that cow's milk and its products are manna from heaven. Make no mistake about it, the dairy industry has been virtually in total control of any and all public health information that ever rises to the level of public scrutiny. The association between the intake of animal protein and fracture rates appears to be as strong as the association between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. That's heavy stuff. So we're going to look in the next section on diseases linked with dairy milk. But just have a think about that for a moment. Since the 1920s, the dairy industry have been cultivating an environment in all areas of society to get us to believe that cow's milk and its products are good for us, when actually it's not. So let's move on and look at that. So in this section, I'm going to give you just a few examples of how dairy milk is very bad for our health. Conclusive studies, and there are many, many more that I could quote from, but for the purposes of time and brevity, then I will just quote a few and I will leave links in the show notes to these resources and some other resources as well if you want to look in a lot more detail at this stuff. But the conclusions really out there are that drinking milk is bad for your health on lots of different levels, from the hormonal level to fracture rates in bones, which is that's so weird isn't it because we're told that milk is good for your bones well I'm going to show you a study in a minute that that shows otherwise and also mortality rates so if you drink milk you're likely to die younger okay so let's look at the first study there was a large cohort study looking forward at risk factors in people's health and which followed a group of people for a period of time and looked at dietary factors on their health. And this was done in Sweden with two cohorts. So one with 61,000 women aged between 39 and 74 
and one with 45,000 men aged uh, 45 to 79. And here's what they found. They found that high milk intake was associated with higher mortality in one cohort of women and in another cohort of men and with higher bone fracture rate in women. And that study was done by K. Microson et al., And this really backs up another study, which was the the huge study, the landmark nurses health study conducted by Harvard University, which followed 78,000 women aged 34 to 59 over a 12 year period. And it's one of the largest investigations into risk factors for major diseases in women ever conducted. And this study found that women who drank three or more glasses of milk per day had absolutely no reduction in the risk of hip fracture or arm fracture compared to those who drank little or no milk. So this just blows out the park any notion that, yeah, we need milk for strong bones and all that kind of stuff and calcium. And this was even after adjustment for weight, menopausal status, smoking and alcohol use. And in fact, get this, so this backs up what we just looked at, the fracture rates were slightly but significantly higher for those who consumed this much milk compared to those who drank little or no milk. Now, a couple of weeks ago in episode six of Eternal Health, we looked at the alkaline diet and how eating foods which are alkaline forming can be really beneficial for your health. Milk is an acidic food. It's an acidic forming food. So once it's passed through your body, like any other animal derived protein rich food, milk has a positive renal acid load, PRAL, And that triggers a protective biological uh, reaction to neutralize all that damaging acidic protein before it reaches the kidneys. So milk, once it's been passed through the body, metabolized, is an acid forming foodstuff. Okay, so I mentioned earlier the hormonal implications of having dairy milk on us humans. And I just want to tell you about a study done by Cheng et al. called Beyond Overweight, Nutrition as an Important Lifestyle Factor Influencing Timing of Puberty. And this study found that early onset of puberty has health consequences, has adverse health consequences. And it was found that children with the highest intakes of animal protein experienced puberty seven months earlier than average And those children who had the highest intakes of vegetable protein experienced the onset of puberty seven months earlier than average. Okay, next health issue associated with dairy is acne. So there's been a number of studies on this linking teenage acne with high milk consumption. And one study found, and this was a study of 47,000 women who completed questionnaires on their high school diet. So this was done in retrospect. It was found that a positive association with acne for intake of total milk and skim milk, and skim milk actually was a lot worse than full fat milk because of the higher concentration of estrogens in that skim milk. There's another study done with 6,000 teenage girls directly that found similar results, a strong link between drinking milk and acne and hormone imbalance. Now there's been a whole raft of studies done linking milk consumption with babies and infants on childhood diseases. So things like type 1 diabetes, childhood obesity, anal fissures of all things, constipation, colic, allergies, even autism and crib death. Now I will leave a link to some of these resources in the show notes if you go to laurarimmer.com forward slash eh008 because there's just too much stuff to go through to, to, (laughs) to cover in this episode. But suffice to say that the insulin-like growth factor 1, IGF-1 hormone that is found in all milk, so whether milk is raised in factory farms or not, whether cows are given these recumbent growth hormones or not, in all milk you get insulin-like growth factor 1, which is innate in cow's milk, and that wreaks havoc on our bodies. And imagine the effect that it has on small babies. The evidence shows that really milk is probably the number one factor in problems, diseases and illnesses in infants. And the irony is 
that women, when they're in hospital, if they can't breastfeed, they're encouraged to have milk formula, which is really concentrated amounts of milk proteins, casein, which our body finds very difficult to break down, IGF-1, and estrogens and lots of other hormones, which play a destructive role on our babies and children's bodies. Okay, cancer. There's been a number of studies on the link between dairy and cancer, and I may well do a whole separate episode on cancer and meat and dairy products because it it is such a huge topic. But a study done by Tate, Bibb and Larkham expressed concerns that cow's milk contains estrogens and could stimulate the growth of hormone-sensitive tumours. So they studied this. And their findings indicated that prostate and breast cancer patients should be cautioned about the possible promotional effects of commercial dairy products and their substitutes because studies done in vitro showed that cow's milk stimulated the growth of prostate cancer cells in 14 separate experiments. So just to conclude this section, linking cow's milk with lots of different diseases, is to say that the evidence is there. It's really completely conclusive that milk is bad for our health on lots of different levels, hormonally, for our bones. And this links in with the propaganda that we talked about earlier, the fact that the dairy industry pumps millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars each year into saying to us, into indoctrinating us that milk is good, milk is good, milk is good. When actually, if you look at the scientific studies, it says milk is bad, milk is bad, it's going to ruin your health. So I may well revisit this in future episodes, but I don't want to go through any more scientific studies because I think we've we've done about enough for today. So I will leave some extra links and sources and, and resources for you in the show notes if you want to find out more about this. But really, by this point, you should be thinking to yourself, if you currently drink milk, I need to reconsider this and look at some alternatives. So If you're thinking that, let's look at some alternatives to dairy milk. And we're really very fortunate where we are in this day and age because there are lots of good alternatives. So let's take a look at some of those. So if you go into supermarkets these days, you will find the shelves lined with various different non-dairy milk options. So I'm going to run through the main ones now. So you've got soy milk, you've got coconut milk, oat milk, almond milk, cashew milk, hazelnut milk, hemp milk, rice milk. So they're the main ones I see in supermarkets and the main ones main ones that I've tried over the years. So a few things to note about these. So we could ask which ones are best? What's the advantage of one over another? What do they taste like? How can I buy them? Where can I find them? How much are they? So let's let's I'll, I'll give you a bit of my experience of these different types of milk. So with soy milk, I would say the number one thing to consider with soy milk is you need to be buying organic because otherwise it there's a strong possibility it could be genetically modified given that something like 90% of the world's soybeans are now genetically modified. So if you're buying soy, which is quite creamy, it's really great in things like coffees and cereals, good tasting you want to be having a soy milk which is organic and it will only usually have one or two uh, two or three ingredients so soybeans water maybe a little bit of salt maybe a little bit of sugar but um but yes you want to be buying organic soy milk coconut milk is a really good alternative and coconut milk tastes really fresh it's really low fat it's low in calories and you want to be looking for the carton of coconut milk not the tin so you know in Chinese and Asian cooking you have tins of coconut milk um, for things like Thai curries and that's not what you want because that that's super thick and dense and massively high in calories and it's not the same consistency as a as a normal milk so you want the carton of coconut milk Oat milk, so again, that's just made with oats and water typically. That's a good one for tea and coffee, quite creamy. Almond milk tends to be, I found, commercially bought almond milk tends to be the lowest in calorie, if you, especially if you get the unsweetened version of almond milk. It's as low as 13 calories per 100 milliliters. So if you're looking to find you know, a low-fat, low-calorie version of a milk, if you're looking to lose weight, almond milk is really good. One thing to be careful of with almond milk and also possibly coconut milk is 
Uh, you want to avoid ones with carrageenan in. Carrageenan is an additive and it's not great for your health. So almond milk, cashew milk, hazelnut milk, they're quite creamy milks. Hazelnut milk in coffee, if you like coffee, is, is yeah, tastes nice. Hemp milk is great. That's probably one of the better quality milks in terms of nutrition because it's so high in omega-3 fats, which is really good for your health. And then rice milk is also a really lovely alternative. So all of these, I would say they're all good. None is really better than another, um, except maybe hemp milk because it's high in omega-3s. But just make sure you can get the ones which are as unprocessed and as few ingredients really as possible. And if you can buy organic, then that's brilliant. I typically pay for a litre carton of any one of these milks a pound. So in the US, that would be what, maybe one pound 30, something like that. Uh, Sorry, one dollar 30. And I usually have to wait for the supermarkets to have a promotion. And then I go out and buy these in bulk. So I might buy 10 litres at a time because they're long life they you don't have to keep them in the fridge you can store them in your pantry in your cupboard so I wait for the, for a deal to come on in the supermarkets and then can get them for as little as a pound a litre which is not bad it's not bad at all and you can use these milks exactly as you would cow's milk so in teas coffee cereal and porridge you can use them for your toddlers I would just check each one individually if it's okay for toddlers and babies look at the ingredients and maybe check um, with a medical professional and maybe just check that it's okay for your toddler but for the most part they're fine for for young children yogurt you can make yogurts you can buy yogurts with alternative milks in and they taste wonderful you can use these milks in baking and cooking in sauces as an alternative for a kind of cheese sauce and you can get dairy-free cheeses which are made with these milks cheese is a topic for another day Um, we'll do a whole episode on cheese now i would say at the very least If you're not on board 100% with buying alternative milks or if you might want to try them every now and then but then also have cow's milk for the time being, then I would say you definitely need to be buying organic, definitely organic because when you buy organic, the cows are free range by law, which means they're not in these concentrated feeding environments. They're not stood in their own sludge, their own manure for days, weeks on end. They must be out at pasture whenever conditions allow. So over 200 days on average per year. There's much fewer pesticides. There's no artificial fertilizers used on pasture cows. And the cows are fed a grass-rich, genetically modified free diet. And routine antibiotic usage is banned. So there's, you know, there's a lot of reasons there why we need to be having, if you're going to drink dairy milk, it definitely needs to be organic. And we can find this again in most places and most supermarkets these days. So do definitely do that. But the better alternative, given all that we've looked at with the health concerns and the the cruelty concerns and the propaganda and everything else is to get a a milk alternative, a nut milk or a rice milk or a soy milk or a hemp milk alternative. And there have been solid studies to show that a plant-based diet, which includes nut milks, is much, much better for health and health promoting. And that will be a topic for another episode as well, the benefits of a plant-based diet on health. So let's recap what we've covered in this episode. So number one, the game has changed. Farming has changed dramatically over the past 50 years and animals, especially dairy cows, are no longer out in fields milked nicely. They're artificially inseminated every nine months or so. They're worked to the bone. They're in these concentrated animal feeding um operations in factory farms in confined environments which contributes to much more infection and disease things like mastitis the levels of pus cells in milk are rising and homogenized milk is allowed to have literally millions and millions of pus cells in every liter of the milk that we drink non-organic dairy cows are also given growth hormones in the US and there's all sorts of artificial fertilizers and pesticides used and they're allowed to be given genetically modified feed all of which goes into the milk and has really negative effects on our health 
Okay, point number two, there is massive propaganda that the dairy industry routinely puts out. $300 million are spent in the US every year to tell us that milk is good for us and to make milk popular and to really just promote and sell its dairy products, even in the face of all the research. So that brings us on to point three, the fact that Dairy is linked with lots and lots of degenerative, horrible diseases that are preventable when we don't have dairy products. So everything from childhood obesity, type 1 diabetes, lactose intolerance, allergies, colic in children, acne, childhood constipation, autism, crib death, to name but a few. And finally, point four is if we're looking to have milk alternatives, then there is an abundance out there these days in our supermarket. So soy milk, coconut milk, oat, almond, cashew, hazelnut, hemp milk and rice milk are the standard ones. And you can buy these easily and cheaply and my advice would be to stock up on them. Also, lastly, on that point, you can make your own milk at home and I would leave a link to a recipe for almond milk that you can make at home very easily, very cheaply in the show notes. And I'm just going to leave you today with a Bible quote that I will go on to explain because I think it's relevant to what we've talked about today. This is from Exodus 3.8 and it says, And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So from that Bible verse, we might think that drinking cow's milk is really good for us and But let's just look at what that actually is referring to. So a land flowing with milk and honey, a kind of promised land of abundance. The key word in this verse is flowing. And it's widely regarded that the honey referred to here is specifically date honey. So fruit nectar as opposed to bees honey, first off. And the milk flowing with milk This means that it's indicative of a greater good, the fertility of the land. And what this milk here symbolizes is superior quality, richness of taste and nourishment. Honey represents sweetness and the goodness of Israel is both nourishment and pleasant. Now, as we've seen throughout this podcast, cattle, cows can survive in really harsh conditions in many habitats, but they only overflow with milk when they're in really particularly fertile pastures and in good conditions. So what this is referring to here is that there's going to be an abundance and overflow of of goodness and richness and that will then enable the cattle to produce an overflow of milk. So it's not necessarily saying go and drink milk because it's good for you. It's a symbolic reference of the abundance that comes from a faith in Jesus, a belief in God and the promise of a new creation in the future. So thanks so much for listening today. I hope you have a great week and I'll speak to you again next time on Eternal Health. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Eternal Health Podcast. Go to lauraremmer.com to download your free Optimum Health Scorecard and find out your current health score, plus tips, coaching, and training on how to get slim, healed, and energized. Remember to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes, and we'll catch you next time on Eternal Health.